Let's talk about a couple of these things when it comes to healing emotional blocks. You mentioned weight loss. What does uh, being healed emotionally have to do with weight loss? What's the correlation? So when it comes to weight gain and weight loss, I've seen many people over the years who have done all the right things, couldn't lose weight and then gain weight. And the people that just reduced their stress levels made peace with their body and then lost the weight. And part of that physiologically, again, has to do with adrenals and with cortisol levels and with this attachment to our body. I'm Linus Woods Mullins, and I love to help women to vibe, to be more vibrant, intuitive, beautiful, and empowered in midlife. So come on, let's vibe. I'm so excited to be able to talk with you about a, a subject that's near and dear to my heart, and that is the importance of emotional wellness as we age. You know, sometimes we think that that depression or anxiety or that stressed out factor or the triggers that we have in our life or things are just the way it is and it's not going to change because you've been dealing with it for years and years and years. But the reality is that's not true. There are things that you can do. And I'm so happy to have with us JJ Fizans. I hope I have it pronounced that correctly. Uh, she is a strategist and the creator of the Empowering Minds Network. And she works with conscious spiritual truth seekers who want to remove those emotional blocks for success. She does a lot of clarifying exercises and she's able to help curate some personalized roadmaps for you to facilitate emotional healing. And I'm so excited to talk about this topic. Thank you so much for being on the Vibe Living Podcast. It's wonderful to have you here today. Thanks, Linus. I'm excited to share this information and hopefully inspire people to uh, learn how to create a roadmap for emotional healing for themselves and to maybe adjust what they're doing so they can get better results. Yes. You know, it's interesting because I think it really is true that we as women, you know, have a tendency to compartmentalize everything and thinking, oh, I'll get back to it later, or it's not that big of a deal because when we're masking, it's covering up the symptoms, you know, initially. But over time, those symptoms just, it's kind of like the emotional closet, you know, you stuff stuff into the closet, you go back and you open up the closet and you think I could put one more thing in there, but you can't. And everything comes tumbling out. And I always say, and I truly do believe this, it's never too late to do something to try to emotionally heal because emotional wellness is just as important as your physical wellness, if not more. So tell me about you and how you got to be so passionate about the need for people to have an emotional roadmap for healing. Well, I've always been curious my whole life. I remember maybe even in junior high or high school, sort of questioning why I reacted a certain way or why I felt the way I felt or why that person felt the way they felt. And although what I didn't know back then was sort of what is perpetuated in our society is victim mentality. We are very quick to blame outside forces and circumstances on how we feel. We do not understand what emotional empowerment or responsibility means because we we look at life and then we react to life and we don't understand that our wounds that were created from the time we were born until seven, when your brain is developing, you're not, you don't have a conscious brain until after seven. So between zero and seven, your brain's just recording whatever happens in your life. Your parents don't show up. You cry. You, you record that I've been abandoned. You, you record that I'm not important, that I'm invisible, that I'm, and it's not a choice. Like we have conscious choice now to, we can understand how to think and then maybe interpret or reinterpret something that we're experiencing, but we don't have that before seven. So those patterns, that's what your subconscious becomes. It becomes a whole bunch of belief systems created by you observing what's happening around you and making decisions without any other input about who you are in the world and who you are to your caregivers and and hopefully how to get your needs met and then learning how to compensate to get that. And that all lives in our subconscious mind. So when you said that I would I would pronounce that the emotional body is is where the healing happens because the physical body responds 
to the emotions. So whether you're in a healing container, you're trying to heal something and you're in a stressful situation, you're not going to heal in that because we only hear in we only heal in parasympathetic. I have a 25 year background in personal training and I've been using my education in all things alternative medicine for years. I'm still doing it, but I'm not doing it the same way. I sort of branched into because what I realized with all of my personal training clients and people who I was helping with rehabbing joints and with weight loss and with aging and menopause and the whole nine yards, that it still was a mental game. And I don't know if your audience knows about or if you know about a book called Radical Remission from Dr. Kelly Turner. Yes. Two books. Okay. So Kelly wrote two books, Radical Remission and Radical Hope. So in there, there are 10, 10 points, 10 pillars for radical remission. She studied 1,500 people who had radically had remission from cancer or other terminal diseases. And then she looked at everything they did and then compared the notes and across the board, there were these 10 things that everybody did that helped their radical remission. Well, seven of them are mental, emotional, and spiritual. Kind of magic. You know, it's interesting because you hear more and more about mindset. It's kind of like the new buzzword that's going on these days, but it really is important. The things, your, your, your self-talk, the things you tell yourself, how you think about things, how you encode the world emotionally. This is information that you need to know and pay attention to. It's not, it's, it's, it really is more impactful than people really realize. Let's talk about a couple of these things when it comes to healing emotional blocks. You mentioned weight loss. What does uh, being healed emotionally have to do with weight loss? What's the correlation? So I, my, my latest book, and I just recorded a, an audio book. Finally, it called, it's called the invisible fitness formula, five secrets to release weight and then body shame. And while there are physical components that are necessary for weight loss and people can be doing those, however, and not get results or doing those and start to gain weight. And that in turn is about our stress level, about our fight or flight, about our adrenaline, about our adrenal fatigue, about our embodiment of our body. So what I mean by that is a lot of people are walking around with their heads disconnected from their body. They are overthinking. They're thinking they have to solve their problems with thinking and education and with their brain. And what they don't realize is that 88% of your subconscious is your body. Your body has all the answers, but you're not listening to it. It gives you signs. It gives you signals. And if you don't answer those signals or pay attention, it will keep getting louder and louder until it takes you down, whether it be <laughs> cancer or a heart attack or whatever. So when it comes to weight gain and weight loss, I've seen many people over the years who have done all the right things, couldn't lose weight and then gained weight. And the people that just reduced their stress levels made peace with their body and then lost the weight. And part of that physiologically, again, has to do with adrenals and with cortisol levels and with this attachment to our body. But just think of it from a personality standpoint. If you and I, and as a personal trainer, this is why I wrote the first book, Fit to Love, because I'd walk into the gym and I could feel, you could palpate the energy in the air. You could feel who was in the gym working out because they wanted to, or they enjoyed it at some level, or they liked it versus the people who literally on the treadmill, you can hear them, even though they weren't saying it, be like, I hate this. I hate this. I hate this. I hate right. this. Oh my gosh. I'm so glad you're mentioning this because there's something else that, that's another kind of myth that a lot of women adapt when they think that they want to lose weight. And the best way to do that is to go hard. Well, the problem with that, first of all, is that it raises your cortisol levels. You may get an opposite effect. But the other piece is that if you're really not enjoying it, it's not going to give you the results that you think that you might get by going hard. And instead, you need to go ahead and do something that you enjoy doing that gives you a sense of, of peace and comfort and it's fun and not something that makes you miserable. Because if it makes you miserable, more than likely, it's not going to work as well. So I'm glad you mentioned that. What, there's something else you mentioned, too. What about in terms of being emotionally well and fit? Cancer. You mentioned about that study. It reminded me of an, uh, about that book, but it reminded me of another book called The Body Keeps the Score and how trauma and life experiences hide it in parts of our body and cause certain maladies as a result of that. So when it comes to these kinds of emotions that could lead to things like cancer and other chronic disease, how does how do the emotions impact that? And what can you do to change that trajectory? Well, it's not even trauma. I mean, we all have trauma. It's really, it's, it's like comparison. Like it's, I, this is all I know. So if my trauma compared to your trauma, it doesn't like, we don't know what it feels like 
to have different levels of trauma. We just understand that this is traumatic in my experience. So mm-hmm. just to make sure that people understand that, because I have a, a client right now who is a cancer survivor. And when we went back and looked at basically how she manifested her cancer and what, and because I had made a statement that to my audience, who knows, likes, and trusts me, <laughs> because I wouldn't say this to anybody else because you would hate me if you heard me say this. But the sentiment was really getting to the point of like, whatever dominant emotion you're living with is what's going to create your reality. It's going to, what's going to adjust your chemistry. It's what's going to change your epigenetics. Whether you have a cancer gene or not, it doesn't matter. It matters that the environment that you're in expresses those genes. There's only six things that are genetic, six conditions. Otherwise, every other gene has the ability to be turned on and turned off based on your environment and based on how you feel, based on what you eat, based on what you think. But generally, it's that sort of stress level thing. So when we look at when we look at her past, she didn't have any huge traumas. She just had general traumas. She had things that she was jealous about, that she was angry about, that she was frustrated about, and she kept that going for years. And the the you know pressure of being a mom. In fact, I think you've had her on the show. It's Jane. Okay. Jane, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, yes. yes. Mm-hmm. Right. So Jane, who's a client of mine, she you know it, she when she came to me, she was all about the physical, the physical, the physical. And I was like, Jane, no, it's not like we got to get off that path. Anyway, there were some epiphanies that happened, and I'll give you just the physical equivalent of that of like how we knew like the data in that. So she was trying to reduce her blood sugar level, her A1C, her doctor, right, her naturopathic right. doctor was trying to get her to, and they tried you know, all kinds of fasting and supplements and diet change and exercise. And she did all the things. And Jane is very disciplined and nothing was budging. It wasn't budging and it was really frustrating. And then when we had this conversation about the emotional root of her cancer and she could actually reflect on and go back and do and really be honest about what emotions were dominating her existence at that time for you know however many years before she had this huge aha and therefore an emotional release and then she she cried she was in the bathtub and then she cried and she had this sort of like she let go of it and then the next thing you know her a1c dropped her blood sugar dropped and she has a, she has she has and, a monitor and- and you made a good point, and I want to really drive this point home about the whole trauma. You're right. Someone else's trauma could be, or somebody's trauma could be someone else's, oh, no big deal. Right. You know, it's it, it, trauma does not mean that you were in a car accident or in a violent act or had some major thing that happens. Not to say that those things aren't traumatic, but we're talking about those things that are personal and traumatic to you that you may not even know were traumatic to you. I I have a reoccurring thought that happens whenever I think about this, whenever I'm talking about this and I'm realizing that, okay, that was probably traumatizing. I was a ballet dancer for many years. I started taking it at four and got really serious about it at nine. Now, I don't know how much you know about classical ballet or training, but that in itself is traumatic. It's just, you're having your body do stuff that it's not supposed to be doing. But anyway, I was at a rehearsal and it wasn't my time to be on stage. And I just had to get out of there. We had been rehearsing for hours, which is ridiculous when I think about it, because we were like, I was only like 12 or 13. It's ridiculous. So anyway, I go outside the school. And as I am walking, I see this man and he's just looking at me. So then I start walking faster and running. And I could sworn that I could see this man behind me walking and running come to find out he wasn't but that's what I saw in my mind and it was scary and traumatic to me even though nothing happened the man wasn't even noticing me they called the police because I was so upset and everything else they didn't arrest him they talked to me says no I didn't even know I wasn't doing anything but that was traumatic and I know it was traumatic because whenever I talk about trauma that comes up in my mind they were used to anyway and so I, you know, worked with my my therapist and peeled back the layers and removed that blockage because it was causing other issues around dance and everything else. And even though I stopped dancing at 62 and I'm 67 now, if I wanted to go back to dance, I would. I don't necessarily want to. But dance was one of those like labor of loves with emphasis on labor. <laughs> I wasn't enjoying it as much as I should have been. And that was the reason why. And I didn't even realize that it had had that impact on me because it was nothing. It was a silly little 12-year-old, 13-year-old girl, probably stressed out, you know, trying to please everybody, working hard, dance in school and all this stuff. And it exasperated to this imaginary man running after me that really wasn't. And it's these kinds of things that we think, oh, yeah, that was silly. I'm over it. Well, Maybe not. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about emotional blockages. Because for me, that was an emotional blockage. How do we remove them? And why is it important for us to remove them? 
well, I mean, it's important for us to remove them so we can get what we want, whatever that is in different areas of our life, whether it be a better relationship, more connection in your relationship, a better relationship with your body. You know, the one thing I didn't finish just to cap off that, like that body image thing and, and weight loss is that your body when you look at your body and you talk to it negatively and you say, hey, because no person, if I said to you, Linus, you know, I don't like you, you're ugly, you're fat, you're stupid. Why don't you change for me? Will you please change for me? You'd be like, mm, what the hell? Like, no, I'm not going to change for you. Your body <laughs> literally rejects you when you're mean to it. If you mm. are not, shame does not make anything happen. Shame, when you shame yourself, you literally, your body, just like a stubborn child is saying, nope, I'm not moving until you love me for who I am. So you have to make peace with who you are. I have another client who just recently finally had a breakthrough with this whole mother daughter weight thing and body image. And, and she wasn't doing anything differently. And she released some weight because of her attention to the love of herself, the acceptance of herself. So anyway, so, so now in terms of the blockages, so that's why we want to remove these blocks because obviously it's preventing us from getting or experiencing or being whatever we want to be. How do we remove them? Well, there's several different ways. Neurologically, when you create a pathway in your brain, and just like with exercise, if you do the same exercise over and over again, you get used to it, you get good at it, it becomes natural and it becomes normal. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of other pathways that you can create. We can do, we can create new neural plasticity through. In fact, I created a program called rewiring your core wound patterns, because in order for you to have these changes, you have to do some rewiring. Now it's not as it's challenging in that there it's normally somewhat uncomfortable. It's somewhat scary or vulnerable, but that's the whole point. It's like, again, think of exercise. You or you're going to go do a sport or a new exercise for the first time. And all of a sudden you're like, oh my God, I didn't realize I had these muscles in this area because you have this soreness of, of doing this new exercise that your body wasn't used to. Well, that's a, that's a version of creating new neural pathways for your muscular response to those exercises. So, so how do we do it is really more personalized. There's not, there's lots of tools, but that's again, why I created the roadmap to emotional healing, because so many people are doing similar tools expecting same results as other people and they're not. And you have to realize that your own journey is personalized and your what you do next needs to have a reason, a well thought out with the expectation of, I used to, as a trainer, I used to have people who would go to Pilates and they would go to Pilates on the machine and and they would expect that Pilates would have them lose 100 pounds. And I'm like, Pilates is never going to have you lose 100 pounds. Pilates by itself or Hatha yoga, right? They just had this expectation that all of a sudden I'm going to go to this class. I'm going to spend two hours or 90 minutes twice a week, three times a week. And I'm, I'm going to lose a lot of weight because I'm spending all this time. Like we're not we're not actually getting into what, what do you expect from this exercise? So I think that it's a personalized plan, but let's just go over a little bit of what, you know, like what people choose. They choose Reiki, they choose therapy, they choose different kinds of healing modalities, they choose yoga and, and all have a place, but they are all going to have a different place or maybe not a place in your own roadmap based on your core wounds. So to bring it back to how do we even start this process? You need to know what your core wounds are. Because I'm sorry, I don't care how many years you've been in therapy, not you personally, but anybody who's listening. If you don't know what your core wounds are, what are you working on? Your circumstances, what happened yesterday with your husband or yesterday with your, your mother? Great. Guess what? That all is about stimulating a core wound. Because like you said about the traumas, we all don't respond the same way to different things. How I interpret the world, what pains me is a wound. And if I don't know what that is, and I don't know how to heal that, or I'm not attending to it, then all I'm doing is managing circumstances. And I'm saying, okay, well, in this circumstance, if I avoid that person and I just become this way, I won't get triggered. Let me manage my triggers instead of healing what's on the inside so I don't have to try to control everybody around me. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because you're right. People don't really take time. We, we are not very much of a peel back the layer society. We have a tendency to want to try to get well through, you know, treating the symptoms and not the causation. And the problem with that is that we start having other symptoms pop up because pop up because we're using pharmaceuticals or other methods that probably aren't as healthy to mask the symptoms. But now after someone has identified those core wounds and they're ready to do some work and be, be vulnerable, what are some of the exercises or modalities or practices do you work with them on? Well, again, it's going to depend on the core wound. So for instance, if someone has a core wound of being devalued, 
the first step after understanding how the circuitry works, because when we get triggered, we are we didn't consciously choose to get triggered. It's a, it's a pathway that's been set up. So we our subconscious interprets a situation in a certain way that looks like our core wound. And so we have this knee jerk response and it could be even a trauma situation with PTSD. It's the same thing. You come back, you know, a soldier comes back from war. Here's a gun, sh- a, a, a car, do a backfire on the car. And it sounds like a gunshot and they go into panic. They go into sweating and their body's shaking because they have PTSD, which we all have a variation of PTSD, right? In smaller, in smaller degrees that we react physically, like our physical body has in a reaction because we don't feel safe. And that's what this all kind of comes down to is the principle that we have in order to heal, especially physical things, you have to feel safe. You have to find a way to learn how to feel safe in the world and to love yourself. And those are two things most people don't feel. So if someone has a core wound of being devalued, and now we understand how the circuit runs, and I'm just going to grab real quick somebody's core wound map, because I have with my clients, I go through something called a core wound map and so that they understand. So for instance, okay, this let's go with disapproved of. So this person, one of the core wounds is disapproved of. And when they when when disapproved of gets triggered, they go to feelings of embarrassment, lonely and hurt, and then they react by withdrawing, avoiding, self-deprecating and being passive aggressive. So when you understand the pattern, that's the first step. You you can you can catch yourself in the pattern and go, "Oh, I just somehow my brain just made that mean that I was I was disapproved of. So you have to be able to create a little bit of conscious space between an, and be an observer of your own actions and reactions and emotions to know that it's there so that you can go, oh, that's what that is. Otherwise, if we don't see it, then we keep repeating the patterns in our lives. We keep repeating it with people, with our, you know, with work, with money, with our body, with, with our loved ones. So there we have to identify the pattern. Then the second step in the map is for you to take responsibility for how you do it to yourself. So just like anything, your core wounds happened when you were between zero and seven. Okay, that's fine. If it was just one thing that happened, if your entire life looked differently, because that created a belief system. But the problem is we repeat that belief system. We believe it to be true. So then the question becomes to the person who is disapproved of, well, how do you disapprove of yourself? So identifying the ways we keep the pattern and the belief alive. So for this person, it was comparing herself to others and finding herself lacking, not accepting herself without needing to be perfect, negative self-talk, and to deflect compliments. So Mm. now we know how this stays active. This belief stays alive because these are the things that this person or somebody does in order to make it a belief that's very strong. Mm. So then the next step is how do I rewire that? Well, rewiring needs you to step outside of your comfort zone and do something to approve of yourself. So for instance, a lot of people, I might have them do some mirror work. I might have them like this person is a singer. And I said, well, go to a karaoke night. And they didn't have any problem doing karaoke, but I was like, you know, go start putting yourself out there more often Mm -hmm. from the place of, because I approve of me because I think, you know, and I have her doing affirmations of the things that she does well or the things that about her that she likes. So, you know, doing, doing some journal exercises, it really just depends on, again, what the wound is and then what your habits and behaviors are. But then you can dial it back and say, well, what would it look like if I approved of myself? What thing have I said I wanted to do that I'm too afraid to do? Or And you put yourself out there. In, my, in one of my last rewire groups last year, I had a chef and she had been trying for 20 years to put herself out there and have her own business. And by the end of the three-month program, she had her own business and clients. But it took 20 years, the first 20, because she was in this cycle of repeating the patterns. But when we looked at it and she understood it and she understood that in order for me to heal this, I have to go into a place where I'm uncomfortable, I'm afraid. And if I do that a couple of times, that's what creates neuroplasticity, then it's easy. And now it's easy. So now there's no shame. There's no fear about putting herself out there. And now she has a business finally after 20 years. So that's the personalization. The rewiring is absolutely personalized. But, you know, things from any anybody can benefit from mirror work or ho'oponopono or Mm -hmm. affirmations or, you know, doing things that are physical. Everybody can benefit at some point. But to the degree that it's going to actually heal your wound is, again, a personal exploration. Yeah, thank you so much for that explanation because it makes a lot of sense. I've heard I've heard a lot about NLP 
and um, I've taken a couple of NLP classes. And one of the things that I'm struck with is that many times the solutions to some of these issues are simple, but it's all about the implementation and consistency and the belief system that makes the difference in terms of how impactful it is. And that's when, you know, working with a coach or someone like you really makes a difference because it really isn't something that if you really want to be long lasting and leveraging the effects to the maximum, it's really something you want to do with the help of someone else because, you know, we see ourselves one way. Another person sees us another way. And there's just things that we're just not seeing because we're not ready to see it or we just don't see it. So I think that's wonderful that you're providing that kind of help. Now, you do this virtually as well. Is that correct? I do it only virtually. Okay. (laughs) Okay. Fantastic. Where are you? Are you in California? I am. Okay, great. So am I. I thought so. Okay. So then we have uh, on our show page, all of your information so people can get in touch with you. And I want to encourage people to check her out because she has a very unique style and delivery that I think most will resonate with most people because sometimes you need someone that's kind of like, boom, boom, boom. This is what's happening. This is how we're going to do this because some of these things have been lying around with us for a long time. And we kind of need to, you know, can I use this word without people getting political? Get woke, okay? Don't take it to the other thing. You got to wake up. What about that? You got to wake up. And, uh, you know, when you're trying to wake somebody else up, you're not, and you've been trying for a while, you're not, oh, come on, Johnny, wake up. You're like, wake up, Johnny. <laughs> I'm about speed and efficiency, not speed, but really more efficiency. And yeah, uh, I can I'm, see I'm, that. Well, I, I've been working on this process for mm-hmm. years. And I have, and it over the years of working with groups and working with people, I, you know, you, you assume that people learn the way that you learn. Most of us do until you're teaching something. And then when you're teaching something and you see that you learned it this way and they're not getting it, you're like, okay, well, how do I need to say it differently? And mm-hmm. so over the years, there are some people that like when I knew, figured out my own core wounds, it was in how I started all this was because I was, I started my podcast and I did this work to save my marriage. Now my marriage wasn't meant to be saved, but I was meant to do this work. So I was meant to learn this. I was meant to do this work for myself. But when I went through this, my ex-husband would tell me all the time, there was a behavior that I had and he'd say, you know, that doesn't work. And intellectually, I was like, I know, like I did. I knew I wasn't lying. I knew it didn't work, but for some reason I couldn't stop myself. I kept doing right, it. Right, exactly. Yeah. So, but yeah. then when I saw my core wound patterns, I was like, oh my God, I've been doing this my whole life. The minute I saw it, I stopped immediately mm-hmm. because my awareness of it has mm-hmm. changed. Sometimes it's that simple. I had a client once in a, in another program before the rewire started and we we did this work, core wound work and everything and do the map. And he was someone who had, he was an alcoholic, ex like drug addict, alcoholic, and he was going through a divorce, but then he was still in his, in his therapy talking about this anger he had about his dad. And I was like, hold up, let's back up this story that you're telling. I don't think it's true. And I gave him a couple different things to look at. And one of them is love language and, and really from his point of view versus his dad. And within one conversation, Mm. within 24 hours, he went from having pain that he'd had for 30 years about his dad that made him destructive, violent, self-abusive. And he was out of that. But in one conversation, when he saw it from a different point of view, he reinterpreted it. He had never felt the love that he had felt at that moment from his dad. And from here on in, that that story completely changed. The story mm-hmm. of my dad didn't love me turned into my dad loved me, and mm-hmm. I feel his love for me. He was pa- he had passed on, mm-hmm. but that's the power of changing the story. That's the power of having a different interpretation. And so many of us I, are I walking around that. with the same damn story. Same all the time. story. Yeah, I do understand that. I had made a conscious decision that I would stop changing the story I would tell about my mother's death. Uh, my mother was hit by a fire truck on her way to work. And the reality is, fast forward 35 years later, I would not be doing what I'm doing now had that not happened. So out of something that was really, really tragic, something really beautiful developed. And I've been able to help literally thousands of women over these last 17 years. So that's the story I decided I would start telling because I realized, I said, wait a minute, you know, it's been 30, well, this time at the time, I was like, it's been 30 years and you got to stop taking yourself through this thing that you go through. It starts in January because she died in March and it was her last birthday. This, you know, I go through this every time in my mind, you know, got to stop all of that because there were some good things that came out of this tragedy. And it, it's really when I grew up and became a woman after my mother died, I, she, I was only 31 at the time, but she was still around. So I was still in ways. 
um, after she was gone, I had to figure out how to raise my, you know, at that time I had two girls or two. Yeah, I just had a baby. I had three girls, had to figure out how to raise them without my mom's wisdom, you know, and I thought I would never, ever have another child. I ended up having another girl, you know, that I raised totally without my mom. So, you know, it's amazing the things that you can do when you begin to start telling yourself a different story. Even if it's uncomfortable at first saying that sort of story to yourself, it's like, yeah, that's true. But isn't that mean to say that, you know, you're glad. And I'm not saying I'm, I'm glad my mother died. No, I'm not. I'm just saying this is what actually happened as a result of this. This is the good that came out of it. And like I tell my kids all the time, I like to focus on what's working. You know, focus on what's good. Sometimes it might have only been one little thing. You know, I I didn't, I, I was taking a walk. There was a pothole and I didn't step in it. Well, hey, that's good. Think about what happened if you had, you know, sprained ankle, can't walk, gain weight, you're miserable, boom, you know. But that was all avoided. Focus on that. Yes, I know the stove's not working. Your husband's an asshole and you don't have enough money in your checking account. I get it. But there's always something in our lives that we can focus on that's positive, that can help you search for other things. And when I listen to you know what you were saying about blockages and all that and core wounds, once you've identified the core wounds, it makes it easier for you to begin to start looking for as to, to be, you know, probably uh, sophomoric, but to be able to tell a different story, to be able to look at your life in a different way. You know, well, so. law, the laws of the universe and quantum physics and law of attraction, you you can't change until you make peace with where you are. You have to make peace with where you are for where you are to change. So it's not possible to complain about your life and ever have anything different. That's right. Absolutely. Wow. You're amazing. Thank you so much for being on the podcast today. I know you probably have helped so many people and you just got through helping more people. You just got to help me talking to me about some things and and, and confirming some, some some things. So thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, and thank you to all of you for joining us on the podcast. It's always great to get together and talk about those things that maybe we think about, but we really don't talk about them. And I highly recommend that you, you know, take check her out and take a look at all the links that JJ has. And, you know, maybe schedule a consult to find out if this is something that could help you. I do know that every single one of you, us, have blockages somewhere that we haven't addressed. That's just how we're made. That's just how, this is how we do the thing. You know, there's lots of things that we just don't deal with. And also I want, I'll have some links also to leading to some of her best-selling books that could be quite helpful as well. Remember, it's all about adding to that toolkit and figuring out what's going to help you along your path. Things that are going to help you be more vibrant, intuitive, beautiful, and empowered. Things that are going to help you vibe in midlife. Thanks so much for listening. And don't forget to vibe. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Vibe Living Podcast. And don't forget to subscribe, like, and comment, and share this podcast. Have a fantastic day, and don't forget to vibe. Bye-bye, everybody.